Hi, good afternoon. My name is Eric Irwin. So I'm talking about selling a home with Python, computer vision, and deep learning. Uh, I guess just to start out, are people, like, is anybody here really comfortable with convolutional neural networks? Is that something you like hear and you're like, I know exactly what that is? Or raise a hand of some people? Cool. All right, I'm, I'm still going to talk about them. I don't mean to like talk down because I'm not an expert in any of this. This is just stuff I did for fun. It was part of a challenge. So. I'm going to try and make it easy to digest, whether it's uh, your first time seeing like computer vision and deep learning, or if it's like a million times. So, uh, if you like, there's all this stuff I put up on GitHub. Uh, be careful if you just start executing the code, because you might end up with a very big AWS bill. So pay attention. But a lot of this is, the code there is more for you to look at, play with, and just get set up. So uh, there's a bit.ly, it goes for the same thing. Congratulations. All right, first picture. How much do you think this home is worth? Uh, kind of a rhetorical question, you don't have to shout out. Just like, maybe in your mind, think like, how much do I think this has to work? So I will tell you, it does have two bedrooms and three bathrooms. It has about 2,000 square feet, so uh, I don't know, to a lot of people, that's a pretty nice house. I mean, to me, I'm jealous of anybody who lives in that house. It's gorgeous. Uh, and then, like, you compare, like, whatever your estimate is, is to try and estimate the same thing for this house. So, on paper, really, this house is a next-door neighbor to the other house. Same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms, same square footage. So, they're two very similar houses in terms of uh, how we may look at it on a piece of paper. But for me, looking at the two of them, I mean, just in my mind, I would say that one of them is worth more on the open real estate market than the other. So hopefully you agree. If you don't, that's fine too. Uh, the main point of this is that this was a challenge that was kind of brought to me. Is how can you estimate the value of a home based solely on the picture without caring about how the market's trending, how the neighborhood is, kind of all this answer information that I believe truly it does a great job of already. How can you just look at two pictures and say how much is this home worth? So from that I work on a system and uh, this is the system that I'm kind of walking through building now. It's for a contest so I did everything in IPython notebooks. Uh, there's a lot of Ansible little scripts that run in the IPython notebook so I can run things in EC2. But, uh, but there are kind of three big requirements in mind when building a system. Uh, it had to be affordable. I had to be able to move quickly because before I started this, I had no expertise in convolutional neural networks, uh, which is the basis of what this is built on. So, and then the last thing is the estimates need to be accurate. Uh, I didn't want to come in here and just say, like, these are accurate estimates. I wanted to make sure there's a workflow where I can go back, trace all the steps, and say, this is why I believe this to be an accurate estimate. And also start out with, So, now I'm just going to kind of say screw it for this presentation. <coughs> These are just some sites to get started. Most of this is done in code. But the overall part of this is, well, are many people here familiar with building workflows for machine learning? Is that a pretty common thing that people have to do for their work? Okay, so if you're not, uh, a lot of it is just getting aggravated at people's APIs. So, that, oh, good. So you're an expert in the field already. Uh, but that's kind of like the basis of this is you're getting a bunch of information, you're trying to combine it and build it into something that has some statistical significance. And uh, in the end, you get this training model. And for those who aren't familiar with what a model is, it's like a big mathematical blueprint that I can throw new things at and it will give me an, something back. So in this case, what our big mathematical blueprint is, is we want something we can send a picture to with no other information, and we want to tell you if it's an expensive house or like kind of a cheap house. I mean, like those two houses to begin with. Uh, and for those who are interested, the first one is worth three times more than the second house, even though they're in the same neighborhood. They have the same kind of square footage inside, but they look really different. So 
in the end, what we'll have is we'll download a bunch of home images. Uh, this is kind of something you do a lot in machine learning is finding a way to go get the information. Then we'll run this algorithm over it. So I won't go into too much depth for convolutional neural networks, but people who are involved with them and have a good understanding of that, maybe you can elaborate for anybody else that's really interested on a one to one basis. But uh, now I'm just jumping into code. So the first part of really working on machine learning is understanding that it takes a powerful machine to do this. And uh, I'm in the unfortunate position that I have to use a MacBook Air quite often. And anybody who's used one of these knows that like the processing power, it's, it's crap. <laughs> and on top of that, it has a bad GPU. And that sucks because I can't play video games on it, which is good for productivity, but it's really bad for this. And the reason is that deep learning, which I always do in quotes because I hate that name for it, uh, deep learning is very intensive with matrix math mathematics and, the, and vector mathematics. And those are great on the GPU. The GPU is made for that. I mean, that's all every video game is. It's like a bunch of vectors and matrices just growing all over. And my issue was that I'm running on this little MacBook Air, and many people are probably working on MacBook Air, maybe something similar, better or worse, but there's, you're gonna degrade your machine by using it for these intensive tasks. So you've gotta calculate that cost into everything, it costs a lot. So in the end, what I did was, uh, I used AWS. AWS has two new GPU instances. Uh, these instances are fantastic, and they're very powerful. So for me, I wanted to use those instances, but they cost 60 cents a minute. Or an hour, sorry. 60 cents an hour, so they get expensive. Uh, anybody who's really like managed AWS for a while knows that 60 cents adds up way too quick. And so I needed to get a way to get cheaper. I didn't need a dedicated instance. I'm kind of exploring. Maybe like some people in here, you've got an idea of some something you can train with a neural network and you want to just try it out, you don't want to reserve like a long-term instance on AWS that will cost you an arm and a leg. So this is what this first set of scripts is. is. This was kind of how I started judging the AWS prices of GPUs and how to use spot instances. Spot instances are an instance that you can kind of fire off a price to and say, as long as the price of a spot instance doesn't go past this, let me use it. So it's a bidding system, they work with the GPUs. And the nice part about it, bless you. So oh, you can kind of read through the code, get some understandings. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really what I do, is I read through this code, I try and understand what it does. If you want to walk through it, and you start looking at it, grab me. I mean, I think I'm going to be done pretty quickly, so maybe just ask some questions or try it out. So there's two very important parts of this that I use a lot. Uh, the first important part, for those that are familiar with pandas, was I was just grouping by each region. So this is AWS region. So the spot prices cost different amounts in different regions. This is the same with every single product that AWS or Amazon offers. If you use something in North Virginia, it costs different than West California. And the spot instances reflect that even more. They go up and down all day. And so this is kind of the first thing I'd look at each, every day as I started setting up instances was I tried to figure out what a price was that I could use an instance at very cheaply for like an hour or two. And so I use this by just seeing like where am I kind of 75% of training this problem. So this is saying, this column right here is kind of saying 75% of the prices, and in this case it was in the last 10 days, so you run this over a set of days, I use 10 days. It seemed to work pretty well for me. And from here I just say, well, in the last 10 days, 70% of things were about $0.7. So roughly uh, 7 cents US. So with this I just know, and this changes a lot. And so we could see it down in here where we, come back to that in just one second. But this is, wow. Hard to see at this resolution. I'm going to just rerun this. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the NB-OG backend for Matplotlib, 
Uh, it just allows your IPython notebooks to be able to kind of be interactive. I find it very useful. What's important here is uh, when I started charting out these three regions, so these were the three regions that had the best price for me. I just looked at like where are they trending right now. So this is a TS plot. This is a horrible use of the TS plot. But an important thing is seeing this yellow line. It dips down the most. It stays the furthest down. And so if you go to north, you just need North Virginia for this kind of exploration. That's where I'd start launching instances. And so. If you follow through this and run this, the next set of scripts you get to, uh, just actually start a GPU instance in whichever region you prefer. So the important part of that last kind of set of scripts is understanding where to set your price point so that you can have an instance to run. And now, what are these instances? So, so now you know how to run an instance, how to price it, but what are these doing? This is where This is where it starts getting complex. So we have this instance running as a GPU, we can run really complex stuff. What we're gonna run on this are convolutional neural networks. And we're gonna run that using a system called CAFE. It's made down at Berkeley. So what this system does is like, it cuts down the amount of time where you have to go and tweak stuff to get like these really sophisticated mathematical models. And it does it very automated for you. And so as you try through these, if you run through these scripts and look through the documentation, what you'll have in the end is a process end-to-end -end that will have a cafe system running with information you provided from the images to the metadata about the images, and you can then predict things about them. So that gets us there. Let's download some images. So again, like we said about APIs were a pain in the ass. This was a pain in the butt, sorry. Uh, Zillow has a fantastic API. I'd say anybody looking at real estate and you want to plot out information and get kind of accurate estimates at how you're going to do getting a house or how you could do better getting a house, uh, use Zillow's API. Zillow and Trulia do a lot of great work on it. Unfortunately, when I was working on this, Zillow's API was down. And so my backup is actually something that I recommend not using this too much. But it was just pulling from a route they use on the website. And so you could see here there's a search route, this get results. Uh, you hit that up with kind of a Latin longitude rectangle, rectangle. It'll give you all the results in that area. And then you can go get their detail pages and get all the images. So that's where all these images came from. Is I just downloaded them from there after kind of scraping one and pulling it off and doing it. So this leaves me with just a whole ton of images and information about the images. Uh, in the machine learning pipeline, just having the wrong information doesn't get too much. So you have a bunch of wrong information, but you can't really train on it. You can't do much about it. And I like to separate things that way. If you've got a very complex machine learning kind of pipeline, is keeping your raw information in the most raw form you can get it so that other people can reproduce the exact same steps you have. And that was very important to me here is that I kept a lot of backups of what I was scraping, how I was keeping it. Uh, I also logged like, what time of day was I pulling it from, how it was pulled, so that this way everything kind of connects together for the next person looking at it and they know like this is where the info came from, you didn't make it up, and if they find something you did wrong, they can go back and correct it at the source. So please, when you do uh, pipelines, especially with images, try to record all that information. Images, I've noticed, do the worst job of this. A lot of academic papers will just have like a zip of images you download, and they're like, just run it on the zip. You have no idea where the images came from, what kind of copyright restrictions they have, any information about it. And so please record stuff in a good, accurate way. Uh, and then, so once I had the images, it was like, it, it was when I started to get to play because that's when I could really launch Cafe and start doing interesting things with the images. So the next thing I did was I just took those and this was a simple transformer that took those raw data files and it output some variables for me. And so I guess this is a second part where uh, an API is going to be. 
in the beginning, I used Mechanical Turk. Uh, are most people familiar with Mechanical Turk? Okay. So in the beginning, I used the Mechanical Turk uh, to try and use it, but for me, it was a horrible experience for this solution. The reason it was horrible was that as I started training through these, I noticed I needed to categorize some of the images. So that training, I'll just show what, what the issue was, which again, this resolution is pretty bad. So jumping to the end, the accuracy I was getting from each one of these images was giving me some good prediction on where the price would go based on iteration. But there was one that was always trending up the more iterations I threw at it, and that was uh, interior images. But the problem is no one really categorized like what is an interior image. Like I could look at a picture of myself and say that's an interior of a house, that's an exterior. But this wasn't categorized anywhere. I didn't find any place where this information existed. And so this was a big spot where I was figuring I'd just give up at the contest and everything I was working on. But then I said, well, that's why I started Mechanical Turk. I went to Mechanical Turk and I said, well, try and categorize all these images on Mechanical Turk. The big downside with that is it costs way too much. It was $400 for me to categorize with no cost validation a thousand images. And for me, I'm working on, on levels of tens of thousands and millions of images. So it just wasn't a good price point. And for me, why I did and why I included in here is the simplest, most janky Django app I could imagine. It's a single HTML page. I load up these images that I download from Zillow, and I made just a very quick keyboard interface that I can go through and start categorizing them with what they are. And it records, the more full version records information about me. It's recording it, kind of the same stuff I give Mechanical Turk, what type of day I recorded it, who was the person recording it, which was always me, and uh, you know what comes out of it. So I made it just a simple web app, so it's still in the code. Check it out there. It's, it, I mean, really, it's a just, it's just a Django app. It goes through this. Did you ever try to run any sort of classification algorithm on that stuff? I did, yes. Uh, so an interesting thing that I learned from running classification algorithm on it, and I'll just repeat. I guess people can hear it close enough. Uh, anyway. Interesting thing I learned about running some clustering algorithms on these images. So one of my favorite clustering algorithms that's so very heavy is one called K-means. So for those familiar, it's just a it's a simple algorithm. It takes a long time to run, but you get some interesting clusters out of it. And so what I ran the K-means on was the different colors in the images. So I looked for patches of blue and other things. I just reduced it down to a vector that's just a reduced down to 256. I turned it into six. And so the interesting thing I found with that was that, uh, and I can see it visually with these, anybody who's used Ben photography will notice every real estate image, especially of interiors, is highly saturated. And that really showed up. That saturation was like just white, like white in images. Even an image that looks like a lawn was so much white I could hardly believe it. So that was one of my biggest clusters and just looking through it. And that's where it kind of, I didn't have much success with it. My hope was I could run some clustering on these and get some sort of idea so that I could say, well, this is most likely exterior, this is most likely interior. I couldn't get that to that point, mainly because of the style of photography that's so often used in real estate images. And that's why I ended up making like a tango out and categorizing so for me, the nice part about having this app is I was able to categorize things at about four, I could categorize four images per second. And so for me, it was two hours of my usual contracting rate to do 9,800 images with a category of internal, external, and stuff. And that, that data set didn't exist anywhere that I could find. And I even ran into Julia's data science team was doing the same thing on Mechanical Turk while I was running this on Mechanical so, yeah, in the end, this was like the shortest time, which also makes me say that anybody who works with Mechanical Turk and has like better contract, uh, try and push them towards like better pricing policy or better ways to work with Mechanical Turk. So, 
But the benefit that this gave me was then I had this data set. It was very high quality. I did it myself. I knew what I had recorded, how I recorded it. I kept information about all of that. So since it was a high quality data set, I didn't need as many images. I didn't have to go out and get 2 million and categorize them all this way. Uh, I was getting a good set of accuracy, which maybe I could here. Yeah. So in this case, most of the time, just judging whether an image is an internal uh, exterior of a house, a garden, it was trivial to get up past 90%. And really, that was just with, if you look, this is at 75 10,000 iterations of a convolutional neural network. So that trend kept going. Uh, it kept running, running until I just killed the instance because it was eating up too many of my AWS credits. But all of that, just the ability to do that was a pretty trivial task, thanks to just uh, uh, hacking stuff together with Django. But let's see, so now we have uh, some images, we have some metadata. Oh, I think I covered most of the things here, Mechanical Turk, some of the Zilla details. Uh, test training cross-validation sets. This was something that uh, I kept bringing up to people the importance of having a test train and cross-validation set and keeping them separate and having some sort of statistical way to tell how good your data sets are. Uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to really really say the importance of this. Keeping track of things in a machine learning system is is the most of the work of just this uh, like clerical stuff. Making sure you've got a test training cross-validation set that are all separate. So what these are used for is the training is what we're actually creating the model based on. So the whole model of this convolutional neural network is created based on that training set of information. The test set is then used to see how well our training is going periodically. So those that are familiar with CAFE, they do a great job of just like, it, it's transparent. It'll just keep running and you kind of see the output, but it serves up both the test and train information without problem. The cross-validation is kept so that at the very end, after you test and train, because as you go through developing this, you're testing it and you're training it, but you keep having to test it and maybe you'll make tweaks to your training to make test pass and, and do things better and you see improvements, but at some point if you keep doing that, your information is all going to be, uh, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to essentially fit to the test data set is a way to think of it. Is the effect. After you do it more and more times, it's just going to be a matter of, you're not doing this to get better in the real world. You're doing this to get better with your test set. And so the cross-validation is kept in like a very separate zone to the end where then you could say, okay, how accurate was this information really? in comparison to the test and training. So, in that way, it separates it out, keeps things sanitary. So, running through here, this just is grabbing some output from that web app or from the Mechanical Turk. Reading through the files and splitting them up so that you can create uh, just some randomized files for this. This wouldn't be the best way to do it in the end. Uh, so, like what this does is it's just taking each of our results we generate it, randomizing it, putting it through, and then doing a randomized sort to it, and then separating them at 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 training information, 20% test information, 10% cross validation. Uh, you can do this a lot smarter. NumPy has a lot of things built in that you can just run. So you start playing with this and you start learning how it works. Uh, use the NumPy stuff. It's fantastic. Then all the books I've read about in the past, so it would be really hard to put it in now. Do you have any ideas of better one? No, actually, someone recently, because I bought I bought the 1730, and then someone's like, we actually validate that. And I was like, I've always heard it as a rule of thumb, but I've never tried. But that seems like something kind of fundamental that someone should have done. So I think it would be interesting. It would be cool to see the history of that and where even that rule came from. That makes sense. Unless you're talking to a frequentist. If you speak to a frequentist and you say that, then it's your sense.
So, uh, numerous times. And so, in both of those cases, exactly that. So, the training in this case, and we'll see it right, let's see a training file right down here. I'm sure I have to do it Okay, so this right here is what a few examples from the training are. So, if you look, it's, it's the actual image file, and then it's the 0, 1, the zero and one, this is tied to kind of you can see it working with Cafe, uh, and the type of loss layer. So what this is generated based on is, these are my different categories. So exterior, dark, and interior. So zero is my exterior. One right here is an interior. But it just needs a number here based on the type of loss that I use. And this is where convolutional neural networks are uh, amazing at. This is kind of, what I love most is learning about convolutional neural networks. And this is where deep learning I keep hearing, and I don't like the name, but in the end, this is a process that I've never seen this level of accuracy with this low of effort uh, in my entire career. And so I love them, and this is what's happening, is that in a convolutional neural network, at the very end, so right out here, this is really where your fully connected neural network but the input and output of that neural network, the output is uh, the category view, which is more. But the input goes all the way back to right after your image of the actual composition of the composition. So what's happening is your fully connected neural network is based off of the features, which are the filters that are that then generated due to the compositions across this image. The network is based off of essentially the filters up here. But a convolutional neural network is just that in the very end you get a fully connected neural network. But before that, where a convolutional neural network is really on the new ground, is up and how it's generating these filters due to the composition. And uh, in this, I, I include a link to this talk that if you're really into convolutional neural networks and neural networks in general, uh, this is one of my favorite presenters. He's done a lot of it on YouTube. He goes in depth on how to work with convolutional neural networks. And his explanations are phenomenal. I mean, I don't care what kind of educational background you may have. This trained me in like days just seeing this. And fantastic speaker. So I highly recommend checking it out. Also, in this presentation, he's using a he's using a technical framework called Torch. Uh, Torch is another deep learning framework. Uh, incredibly powerful, and you can do a lot of like really deep research using it. So a lot of the latest uh, academic papers are using Torch. And if you go here and try it out, the same AMI that you set, that you could have set up from this second script right here, from this right here, <coughs> this is based on an AMI that someone else has done, and it includes Torch and Cafe. And so if you go through his presentation, he'll give a little demo where he's like, oh, this is how you do a convolutional neural network in Torch. And it's like 10 lines of code, and you can run it on these instances with no further installation required. What's that last uh, it, It's I, I really don't want to pronounce it wrong. Uh, I believe it's practice. But, no, I need to make that link. Oh no, please. Nando the first. So, this is a great explanation. Anybody trying? This explanation is great. I also include some other ones. If, if you start playing with this and you're like, these, uh, I see the promise of these, I want to research more. Uh, I include a few things to recurrent neural networks that came out of learnings here. Uh, they also run in port strips, so you can get that bootstrap on these instances really quick. Recurrent neural networks. Uh, just amazing. They, they, they're another amazing thing. Does it make sense for processing? I mean, it's just a free processing, like just for brightness and PP values, to sort of normalize them as some sense of images, or maybe etched up or at a different source. Like, 
It's also the really light, bright ones. And some are going to come from an iPhone with really dark, not really well lit. So. Oh, it's a, it's a great point. And so one thing about it is trying to consider these pre process. <laughs> uh, Pre-processing images is something that I, I don't do in this. In certain more networks, it's incredibly useful. In this case, this actually is doing it for you. Dealing with the convolution, they're generating filters. And so those filters are like going through and cleaning up the image in that way. And in that respect, as it goes through, man, I can't this uh, After a ReLU layer, there's another layer that it reduces things down. And so that's called the pooling layer. And so that's kind of like compressing it down. And that's where, that's where you can easily make a lot of changes to do exactly that. So if you're noticing your filters are coming out horrible, you go in your pooling layer and you can just tweak some stuff around and start really improving that. And that for me, the hard part of this whole process was getting to the point where I could tweak those settings in the network. Because in order to do that, you need a data set, you need a machine to run it, and you need like, just getting Cafe and Torch to work sometimes is a, uh, man, it, it takes some patience. And, and, well, yeah. um, this data set seems to imply that um, all of your networks um, affects the price of the property, which is usually way things work, but in certain real estate markets, it's not really supposed to correlate. So, did you do any correlation of, I mean, this one, this might, you do this on the Portland market and try it on any other markets? So, there's a very interesting point about that I, that made me very happy. Was when I originally trained this, I trained this with information from the Bay Area. Uh, and this was even like the first set of images. I'm sure I can get some. So, the first set of 9,800 images I used, these were all images pulled from the Bay Area. And so, the Bay Area prices are. But the part that like that really blew my mind was then I started training in the Portland and Seattle area. I took one of the images of an exterior of a house in the Portland area and I checked it against here, and the estimation was totally off. So this image was of just a little shack out in the woods in Portland. I mean, it's like a 20k like homesteading place, and I put it in San Francisco to see what would happen. <laughs> and it was 32 million. <laughs> <laughs> so, you had the yard. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find the yard in the Bay Area. Yeah. So, exactly what you're saying is very important. Looking at the location changes a lot. So, yeah, oh. oh man. Okay. I'll hold it like this. <laughs> uh, yes, location is very important. Uh, I would actually love to live in that shack. It's totally awesome, especially in the Bay Area. <laughs> but for third, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. and uh, let me see. I'm gonna just check over. I mean, really, for me, this is more time than I ever talked about this for. Usually, it was just walk through the scripts, let people play around, and try and run cafe. Uh, there's a few just helpful scripts I put on there that are just like things I'd run to just be like, okay, just run cafe and I'll pull it out later. Uh, some r really useful that I didn't know how to do before using this that anybody else doing a lot of IPython work, it's awesome, is uh, using Ansible as a library. So if you look here, I actually run Ansible from my IPython notebook to get some information back. So this is incredibly helpful because I'd have this one instance up and I'd want to get information as it ran, but every other solution I had was like, just poke a big hole in the firewall and like let anybody in and out or make this rsync job that goes every five minutes. But then when I'd send this to somebody to comment on what I was doing, they're like, well, where do I get this data from? And so having Ansible in this way and a way to track back how I launched the instance was incredibly useful as I started iterating and changing around like the topology of the network. But, I mean, that's pretty much it. I, I wish I could have found a way to do this better as live coding. My real intention was to try and get people to see that like, you'll hear deep learning a lot. Uh, companies are investing a lot. I mean, IBM just bought out Alchemy for an unprecedented sum because they do some deep learning. 
So it makes a lot of hype waves, but the most interesting part for me is that this entire process of training neural networks to predict house prices and do all this, it took a lot of my time, but in operations cost, it cost about $7. And from what I've learned about Portland coffee, that's like a small coffee. So it's not bad. So I hope like people have just tried out, uh, tell me what sucks about it, what they like, what they could use help on. Like just try out the code, see what you can use, and bash what you can't, and uh, see how easy this stuff is to make your own pipelines to do stuff that's really been like, you know, it seems really hard, but as you play with it, it's easy. Yeah. Uh, so what, what I did do for that, so these prototypes, this is a bad name for it. Uh, the prototypes, this is like an internal cafe thing. But th these are the parts that I tweaked a lot. And if you notice, this, is, this, this one right here is based off of cafe. And so what I didn't tweak the values going into the neural network, but I did, I tweaked every parameter that goes through the different layers. And so as you work with this, that's where convolutional neural network blew me away at their simplicity. If before, if I put a neural network to say like, this is a dog butt versus this is a cat. You know, in order to do that, it took a lot of tweaking of those neural network parameters, those input and output and the whole layer, the whole topology. In this case, it's going through this prototype and just tweaking what each layer does, what the input to that layer is, what the output. And uh, in that talk, they explained very well how to deal with these different layers and how you can tweak them. What is the training mechanism for this? Oh, sorry. What is the training mechanism for this? Back propagation. It is back propagation in this case. So if, if you really want to get a cool setup, is check out Siamese neural network and how they work in the same environment. Uh, that was that's a really cool experience to see how both back propagation and forward propagation can go into the learning steps. Can you control that with any kind of like chatting before we end stuff like the uh algorithms? Cafe's not designed for the Mac algorithms, as far as I know. Uh, my expertise is from just using it. But what's what's nice is just how well their code is written and documented. So I include links to some of the papers that the cafe people wrote, but uh, checking out their source code, it's it's very well written. And they separate it based on the CPU version or the GPU version. So, that's right. Did you try writing a neural network to tune your neural network? <laughs> <laughs> no, mainly because I couldn't quite justify that like hundreds of dollars of AWS time. But, uh, people are, and what they're really using is more gradient descent for these layers. So they'll use like gradient to descent to try and test these different layers and see how it works. So another cool project is to use uh, another Cal Berkeley creation, uh, Spark, which I quite like. They have a lib called MLLib, and in MLLib, it's kind of designed to take a lot of this parameter fitting and do it automatically for you. Uh, and that one's a just pleasure to watch it go. Single machine with one GPU with one. Yeah. But these are like uh, these are the Tesla GPUs from NVIDIA. So like I think when I saw one of the GPUs that they don't give them to set for the general public, but one of the invoices I saw was like four hundred thousand for one of their GPUs. So like these aren't cheap GPUs, right? Like, <laughs> they're crazy. And this is actually these are the G2 two extra larges on AWS. And these are also, I mean, it's under 10 cents an hour to start playing around with it as a spot instance. But if everyone starts using the spot instances, that's going to really suck for me because then the price is <laughs> So just buy one or something. Oh, and next question.